Hi, welcome back. Um, here's a last installment of our chapter five um, lesson in biological membranes. This section is going to talk about active transport. So at this point, you should be pretty comfortable with the passive transport mechanisms of simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion and osmosis. Uh, again, don't move on to this new material until you feel pretty comfortable with those other sections. You can always come back and watch this when you feel um, able to explain those processes. All right, so if you remember at the beginning of the passive transport video, I kind of defined the differences between these two mechanisms. So passive transport is substances moving across a membrane without using any energy. The cell doesn't burn energy. The substances move down their concentration gradient. That's kind of the built-in um, energy needed to move these things. In active transport, the cell actually expends some of its energy to move things uh, against their concentration gradient, opposite the direction that they would normally want to go. So there's a couple different reasons why cells might want to do this. Um, a lot of times they do this to bring in nutrients. So you have, you know, a lot of glucose already on the inside of your cell, but you're constantly using it and you need to bring in more. So this is a way that cells might spend energy to bring in the sugar that will then get them to um, make more energy by breaking down that sugar. Um, also, another major use of cells burning energy to use active transport is to make a concentration gradient because um, then they can utilize that concentration gradient later. So we'll see that um, a little bit later. So the first, uh, the major example of active transport that we're going to talk about is what's called the sodium potassium pump. This is very common. It's found in all cells, both prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So it's something that's been around for a long time because we see it in all different cells. All of our body cells, um, plant cells, animal cells, they all have the sodium potassium pump bacteria. So in this mechanism, we are going to kind of, we'll set up the situation here. So on the inside of the cell, right, that's on the lower side. Um, and then the outside of the cell is up here at the top. So in this overall process, what's going to happen is we are going to be moving sodium out and potassium in. And the reason for primarily for the sodium potassium pump is to maintain gradients. So for cells to work properly, um, they tend to have a higher concentration of sodium outside and a higher concentration of potassium inside. This sets up the what's called the transmembrane um, concentration gradient. So knowing that we have a lot of sodium outside and a lot of potassium inside, the cell is then um, can use that for other types of processes. Um, we won't get to really those now, but we'll see those a little bit later. So embedded in our plasma membrane, we have a carrier channel. So it's one of those ones that change shape, right? So it's not a channel. It's actually opening and closing depending on what's going on. So let's start with um, kind of our first, well, it's a cycle, but we'll start somewhere. So we're going to start with number one. <clears throat> so in this first position, the channel is open pointing inwards. So it's open to the inside and we want to take three sodiums that are in the cytoplasm and eventually move those to the outside of the cell, right? So that's this direction right here. Those are the three sodiums. So with the channel in this open position, it has three little docking sites for those sodiums, right? So the sodiums are kind of shown as the little orange circles. They fit into those nice little purple um, crevices there. And so that's going to be um, their binding site, if you will, kind of a molecular puzzle piece. So once they bind, a molecule of ATP comes in. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. We're we'll learning more about that in chapter seven. <clears throat> Excuse me. So once that ATP binds, it breaks off one of its phosphate groups and it gets converted to ADP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate three. And one of those phosphates goes away and then it becomes adenosine diphosphate. That's a lower energy kind of offspring, if you will, of ATP. And if you'll notice, that third phosphate got stuck onto that protein. And this whole process of binding the sodiums, ATP coming in, 
breaking off that third phosphate, all of that does kind of all simultaneously will kind of cause it to open and kick out those three sodiums. So we have sodium coming in and binding, ATP binding, breaking that phosphate group, boom, and we get that change and that kicks out the phosphate. Okay, now if we take a look, now we're open to the outside and our binding sites for the potassium, two potassiums, um, open up. And so now we have potassiums out here <clears throat> that want to go into the cell or we're trying to get them to go into the cell. We still have that phosphate group hooked on when it's in this position. So how do we get it back to the open position facing towards the inside of the cell? Well, we've got to pop off that phosphate group. So when the phos when it's like this, we still got that little phosphate group stuck on. When we open it or when the phosphate group gets um, released, it then is going to change back to this position. And when it does that, it kicks the potassium out and it's ready to take up the sodium again. So it's constantly going like this. So if I can get my hands right. So sodium gets kicked out, potassium gets moved in. So sodium out, potassium in, sodium out, potassium in, sodium out, potassium in. And it is constantly doing this. That is one of the things that we use our ATP for to maintain this concentration gradient. So I have a picture of this guy's shirt. Now, one of the, the um, drawbacks of not having in-person classes is I don't wear my, I have a whole bunch of cool science-y t-shirts that you guys would have gotten to see. Maybe I'll wear some in the uh, other lectures, but I put this up here because I don't have um, active transport t-shirt, but they sell them. So um, outside of the cell, we have high sodium concentrations and low potassium. Inside of the cell, we have low sodium and high potassium. But the nature of active transport is to move potassium into the cell against its concentration gradient while we move sodium outside of the cell against its concentration gradient. So we can see that over here, right? So we have higher potassium inside of the cell, active transport moves it against the concentration towards the higher concentration and the sodium it's opposite so we're always pumping sodium out and pumping potassium in all right so this is our the, the prime example of active transport there's lots of different examples that we're going to be seeing in other uh, contexts within different organelles but this kind of encapsulates the big idea is anything or any time you're going to move a substance against its concentration concentration gradient through these membrane channels, this is what we call active transport. It's like the swimming up, up river. You, if you just hopped on your inner tube at the top of the river and floated down, that would be like passive transport, using the gradient of gravity to let you flow down. If you hop on your inner tube at the bottom of the river and want to get to the top, you have to go against the gravity. You have to input energy like kicking or paddling or get a motor to move you against that. Uh, gravity gradient to the flow of water. So you can think of that maybe as an analogy that could help you um, understand this concept. Okay, um, here's a couple other examples using um, active transport and what's co called co-transport. So the sodium potassium pump we just saw is an example of this co, um, well not co-transport, it's what's called counter-transport. Co-transport is when two items are moving in the same direction. So if we take a look um, at the top example here, we have an active transport of uh, hydrogen ions in this, this pump here. So if you'll notice, we have a whole bunch of hydrogen ions out here and just a few hydrogen ions inside. And with the power of ATP, we're gonna pump those hydrogen ions to a higher concentration gradient, right? So that's our active transport. Now, if we take a look at this co-transporter, the sucrose hydrogen ion co-transporter, what it does, again, this is one of the reasons why we might want to do active transport to build a gradient, because now this co-transporter, as hydrogen wants to go back down its concentration gradient, it grabs hold of, almost holding hands, saying, come along with me, sucrose. And as the hydrogen is going back down its gradient, sucrose can come along. So sometimes our cells work in tandem that way. And all right, so let's spend some energy to make a hydrogen ion concentration gradient and then allow that hydrogen to go back down passively and bring in something with it passively. Um, and then sucrose is a, it's sugar, so it's an energy source. 
So the cell is willing to do that instead of just trying to actively transport sucrose. It might be more efficient to actively pump hydrogen and passively let sucrose flow back in with hydrogen. Um, this example down on the bottom is our uh, allowing glucose to come in against its concentration gradient, right? So I know my head's kind of in the way, but we have high glucose here and low glucose here. But if we take a look at the directionality of glucose, we see glucose wanting to go, <clears throat> or not wanting to, but um, is being moved in, and it's being moved in with sodium. So we have a higher sodium ion concentration outside the cell and a low sodium concentration inside of the cell. So sodium, it's high outside thanks to the sodium potassium pump. Um, and so it is able to go passively down its gradient, but at the same time, it's bringing glucose against its gradient. And so again, just like this uh, co-transport at the top, the cell's spending energy to make a hydrogen ion concentration gradient to allow sucrose to come in passively. In this scenario on the bottom, we're using the sodium potassium pump to make a sodium gradient to allow us to move glucose in passively. So we can kind of hijack this active transport of what would have been active transport with moving glucose against its gradient into a passive by hooking it together with sodium, which is moving down its concentration gradient. Okay, so those are some examples of why we might use active transport. Uh, it helps us get things almost for free, kind of, right? A two for one deal. All right, these last few examples of active transport are what we call bulk transport, large scale transport. It's not at the level of a membrane protein, it's all like vesicles. So we have two major groups we have what's called exocytosis and endocytosis. So exo meaning going to the outside world is you have your vesicle, all right, so here's your vesicle. Maybe it's got a waste product or a secretion. Maybe it's saliva or a, a glandular secretion that needs to be uh, excreted to the surface. And so here in our micrograph, these are our vesicles. The black dots are products. And if you'll notice right here, here's our membrane. It's fused to that vesicle. And now the product is being released outside of the cell, it's so cool. So again, going back to the nature of those phospholipids, they can fuse and become a continuous, that's not a good color, it kind of blends in. They can fuse and become a continuous part of the membrane, releasing whatever was inside that vesicle to the outside world, so that's exocytosis. The opposite of that is called endocytosis, and um, there's two types of endocytosis, there's phagocytosis, phago or phago means to eat, um, so phagocytosis is a cell taking in solid particles. So if this was like a food bit or this was like a bacteria that we have down here in this actual micrograph or a amoeba is eating a big bacterium, that is the thing that's being taken in. The membrane kind of works itself around, fuses, right? So become a complete membrane again. But now we have our vesicle with a food inside that will then fuse with a lysosome and because you've done chapter four, you know lysosomes are our garbage disposals, right? So they contain acids and enzymes. So when they fuse, it kind of breaks down whatever you had just, just ingested. That's like your digestive system if you're an amoeba or a white blood cell. Um, in the helpful links, I have a video. I think it's titled like Amoeba Eats Two Paramecium or something like that. I highly recommend you watch that because it's super cool to see this amoeba wrap its pseudopods around a couple of paramecium seals it off, you can't see it, but you'll notice when the lysosome fuses with that vesicle, you'll see the paramecium reacting to the influx of probably some kind of digestive secretion. That's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, all right, so that's endocytosis, phagocytosis. Um, so we're bringing stuff into the cell. Phagocytosis is primarily for solid things. Another example of endocytosis is what's called penocytosis, which is taking in liquids. Um, not solid. So sometimes this is called cell drinking and phagocytosis is cell eating. So you might have, you might see that somewhere. So in cells, they kind of, um, their membrane gets into these folds called microvilli. And if they're in a watery environment, the, those um, kind of spaces in between the microvilli can seal off into these little vesicles. And so now we have a penocytic vesicle 
um, penocytotic vesicle, and then whatever fluid they took in can just get released into the cell. So this is penocytosis, a type of endocytosis, which is cell drinking. And we can kind of see that here in these little in, in folds, it'll eventually fuse in and take in whatever fluid is trapped in that little uh, infold. All right, so that is it. So we finished chapter five, yay! So these are really applicable processes. So I strongly encourage you to get super comfortable with um, membrane structure and function, uh, hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic osmosis, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport. We are gonna be seeing those quite a bit, um, especially in chapter eight when we get to cellular respiration. We're gonna really apply those concepts um, to that chapter. So send questions, stop by office hours, the Zoom office hours, uh, get help early and often, and I will see you next time. Bye.